are there differences in the nutritional profile of GMO crops versus the same crops, crops grown conventionally? There's a, I saw a analysis of corn that were grown, was grown in adjacent fields and the amount of nutrients in the GMO corn was, was a fraction of the non-GMO corn. So it was not a published study. I, do I did talk to the people who were, did it and how it, was, how it was compared side by side. Um, it's not, when you look at the 1996 article that I mentioned about the soy, Monsanto said that in the title that their genetically modified soy is substantially equivalent to non-GMO soy. Um, and even though they said that, there was a 27% increase in trypsin inhibitor in their soy and also changes in the fat content, and other, well, there's changes in other things, in the fat content of milk and animals that ate the soy, et cetera. Then Barbara Keeler, a medical writer, found in the journal, in the archives, uh, the only side-by-side -side comparison of the GM versus the non-GM. They had actually rigged their research by creating a lot of statistical noise to making it hard to determine, but there was side-by-side -side evidence that they didn't publish. And she found that the trypsin inhibitor in the cooked soy was as much as seven times higher in the GM soy compared to the non-GM soy, which could be cause allergic reactions and all sorts of digestive problems. There was an increase of about double in terms of an anti-nutrient, and there was a reduction in protein, a bunch of changes. And this is part of the unpredicted side effects as a result of the genetic engineering process. But then you add to that two things. You add the spraying of Roundup and Roundup grabs onto the minerals. And I've looked at graphs from published papers showing the amount of minerals that get into the plant, and it's a fraction, and the amount that, that translocate through the plant, and it's a fraction of that. So you end up with mineral deficient plants because of the Roundup. And then also, as every organic student knows, the quality of the soil supports the quality of the plant. And Roundup kills beneficial bacteria in the soil, it promotes soil-based pathogens, it promotes fungal growth, and then b basic monoculture uh, destroys the quality of the soil. And so then again, you also have reduction in the, nutrient, the nutrients in the crop. So, but there hasn't been a lot of side-by-side -side comparisons with a lot of details, just the, the one that I know about. Well, and let's not forget uh, what those GMOs are being used to make. So it's not just about whether GMO corn or non-GMO corn is better for you. The GMO corn is being used to feed chickens to make chicken nuggets. So w do you want to eat a chicken nugget or do you want to eat some broccoli? I mean, you got to remember the meta argument here. It's not just about the micro, it's also about the macro. It's like, what food are these products being used to make? To say nothing of soil health, water quality, uh, the herbicides, the fungicides, the nitrogen fertilizers, the algae blooms, all the other things that are built on top of it, the 200 million acres of monoculture GMO crops, all that is connected to it. So it's not just about the cellular health, it's also about the macro health and the public health, just to keep the eye on the, on the larger picture. W aren't um, scientists and university honest, wouldn't they tell us if GMOs or the chemicals to grow them were bad for our health and bad for the planet? Um, saying, aren't the scientists and the university universities honest? Wouldn't they tell us if GMOs or the chemicals to grow them were bad for our health and bad for the planet? I think there, I think there are some independent scientists uh, in the academic world who are not funded by industry and who would speak truth to power. Um, and there have been uh, friends of mine in the past who have done just that. I mean, famous, um, you know, environmentalists. Um, and uh, what I don't see is a lot of people in the American scientific community as active on this issue as the Europeans. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly why the American scientists haven't been writing about the health effects studies that have come out, um, why the scientists with the knowledge of toxicology and the knowledge of 
food science have, have not been as active on this issue, even though they're decent scientists who, you know, maybe they're busy in other areas of research. I know that there's a group of scientists who just believe in the National Academy's mantra of, well, there's really no problem here. We're talking about uh, not a great difference between um, traditional breeding and, and this new kind of breeding. And that may affect a number of people not to step into this arena. Because when you step over the National Academy, there are consequences. The journals, for example, don't like to report your research if it goes against the tide of the prominent scientists. In my talk yesterday, I listed a number of prominent scientists, some Nobel Prize winners, who proclaimed that this is a non-issue, the, namely the safety of GMOs. And um, I, I was able to get a couple of articles published that took a long time to get published, like six months because of the reviews. But not a lot of people are writing about it. I, I don't understand exactly why, except the fear of going against the grain. I, I think just briefly to get a little bit, just quickly some history here. Uh, during during uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, basic deregulation and uh, a lot of defunding of independent research by the feds. So when federal funding got cut, uh, that meant universities had to rely more and more on corporate funding. And that's been true for the last 30 plus years. But more than that, because of a couple of bills that were passed in Congress, Technology Transfer Act of 1986 being the final one, I don't need to give you the details, the ones that were prior, it now actually, if you get federal funding and, you, uh, and a patent emerges from that, even though it was emerged from federal funding, you have to share that with a private corporation. So every one of those uh, colleges now has a, a, a what's called intellectual property division. Their whole job is to take discoveries from the university, work with a private corporation to get those patents out, and that includes agricultural patents, biotechnology patents. So that's how they're feeding a lot of their research. Additionally, you, I mean, Cornell has been basically Monsanto's tool for the last 30 years that I've been involved in this. Uh, they just Monsanto just gave 27 million dollars University of Berkeley. Uh, we're seeing some effects on that. So. By taking away federal dollars, that leaves the field open for corporations, and then they even passed a law saying, you, even though it's federal money, our taxpayer money that did that research, you are forced by law to give that patent to a private company, 1986 Transfer Act. And that has really completely corrupted science in American academia. Um, what are the concerns regarding genetically engineered insects, animals, trees, and fish, and have they been released anywhere? W what are the concerns regarding genetically engineered insects, trees, animals, and fish, and have they been released anywhere? I could talk a little bit about the mosquito. Uh, they have released genetically modified mosquitoes. Uh, Oxitec has released the mosquitoes there from the UK. And they're, they say they release only the males. They mate with the biting females and produce sterile offspring to reduce the population of the Aedes aegypti mosquito, which carries dengue and Zika. And so it turns out they were lying. They do release a lot of female mosquitoes because their sorting mechanism is flawed. So they release tens of thousands of female biting mosquitoes. And also, between 3 and 18% of the offspring are not sterile, up to 18% if it's in the presence of a particular antibiotic, uh, which is in, in, the, in the environment, 3% normally. I remember I was testifying in Key West at the uh, Mosquito Control Board, uh, trying to get them not to accept the Oxitec mosquito. And a man named Derek from Oxitec was, test, was testifying on behalf of Oxitec. And afterwards, I asked Derek, I said, have you ever tested the saliva from the mosquito? Because if you get bitten by a mosquito, the saliva enters your bloodstream. And he said, uh, we're just now testing to see if the, 
expressed protein is in the saliva. They had already released the mosquito, millions of them, in Malaysia, Panama, Cayman Islands, and Brazil. But they were just now testing to see if the expressed protein, in other words, they insert the gene, if that protein was expressed in the saliva. And I said to him, you know, there was a study done on a cystic fibrosis cell, and they inserted a gene, and they found up to 5% of the naturally expressing genes changed their levels of expression in the presence of a single inserted gene, which could increase the level of an allergen, a toxin, a carcinogen. Shouldn't you be characterizing the entire saliva of the, of the mosquito to see if it was changed and if that change was dangerous? And his response was brilliant. He said, good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, um, the, 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 there's plenty of, there's, there's the possibility of environmental displacement and there's a better and safer alternative in Wabaki. Other people can talk to that. But the idea of being bitten by a genetically modified mosquito uh, is not something that I savor. Uh, and they want to genetically engineer, um, they wanted to do olive moths which would le leave their larva in the olives, and then we'd eat the olives, so we'd be eating the actual genetically modified larva, and they forgot to, to pay attention to that, so that when the European authorities asked about that, they withdrew the application. And these are the brain cells behind uh, introducing an entirely new species that can become part of our ecosystem uh, and, and bestowed upon all future generations. As far as trees, just remember, that's all, you know, the, the, the less you can control something after you've released it into the environment, the more dangerous it can be. And often the smaller, the more dangerous. So bacteria, it was not in the question, but bacteria, right? Genetic engineered bacteria, that's gonna reproduce, you're not gonna be able to control that once it's out, right? Now with genetically engineered trees, they live so much longer than plants. They're much more dangerous in many ways than genetically engineered plants. Imagine these trees living for decades, some even longer, shedding their seeds forever. But now those are genetically engineered. So that actually, longevity is another part of the, the danger calculus on that. We mentioned fish, that you cannot recall them. So the, the problem with these um, errors that they've made with fish and others is that you cannot, uh, the precautionary principle is what you should use because you're not gonna be able to recall them and you're not gonna be able to get them back. And ironically, we talk about genetically engineering humans, it's obviously very controversial, I'm obviously not for it, but it's probably far more dangerous for, the, for us to genetically engineer bacteria I mean, there's no people that are talking about bacteria rights or mosquito rights or, or virus rights, but actually for us, that probably is where these catastrophes are hidden because once they're out there, there's no way to stop them from multiplying, disseminating, reproducing, and traveling wherever they're gonna go. So that is, the, again, the, we've said it a few times tonight, that's one of the great dangers of this technology. I'd like to ask a, a follow-up question. Oh, hold on, actually. Sure. Why don't we... Um, Everyone take a final two minutes for a wrap-up statement. So everyone's got 10 minutes left, so everyone take two minutes each to make your final closing thoughts. Sheldon, you want to start? Uh, I'll, I'll okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sure. Want to start, Mark? Oh, 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 Sheldon, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, well, Mike, uh, um, um, to, I think, I think the, 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 the question of really GMOs just to expand upon that, and I will try to take two minutes, is essentially who has control over our food system. So underlying this entire discussion um, is the fact that there are actually a very small number of companies that actually produce GMOs. There's maybe four, possibly three, that, will, uh, that produce GMOs. And those um, four companies, awaiting word of whether the Bayer-Monsanto uh, merger will be approved, um, uh, essentially control already more than half of the seeds that are in circulation in the world. Many of those are GMO seeds, not all of them are GMO seeds. We're talking about the big picture. So I think the fundamental question that GMOs lead us to is who uh, are we going to kind of put our faith in the future of our food at a time of unprecedented environmental stresses uh, in the hands of four, possibly three companies. And um, this is the subject of my book, Seeds of Resistance, and it's a subject that I hope people think about going forward. Thank you. Yeah, I, I want to use this to bring up something that we haven't talked about, which is that uh, 
current, as we currently know, it, genetic engineering is scientifically uh, incoherent. Uh, you may remember there was something called the Human Genome Project. People remember that? Human Genome Project. We were supposed to have 100,000 genes. Well, at the end of the project, it turned out we had 19,500 genes. Uh, uh, Pinot Noir grapes have 40,000. Uh, corn has 30,000. And wheat has 100,000. So if you were to take the supposed genes of five Nobel Prize winners, it would equal that in a cell of wheat. These are facts. This is not me talking. This is established science. What that proves is that DNA is not the basis for the complexity of life. Each of you has, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 million cells in you. It all has the same DNA except for your red blood cells, but it, you have muscle cells, brain cells, toenail cells. The DNA doesn't control that. DNA is one piece. It's not the composer. It's not the conductor. It's not the whole orchestra. It's like the second or first violin section. But meanwhile, this entire technology has been based on that you can manipulate DNA and you're going to actually be able to change major phenotypic traits in organisms. Not true. Everything they promised, changing nitrogen fixation, changing ability to grow in drought, changing nutrition, all of that doesn't work because it's much more complicated than that. I debated Bob Fraley at Monsanto and the Commonwealth Club and he admitted frankly we were wrong in the 1980s. DNA is just one piece of the puzzle. As Jeffrey was saying, there's RNA, there's something called epigenetics, which is all involved in histones and methyl caps. They have, their, they have their animals like us. We have actually more cells in us that are not us, that are our biome, than we have cells that are us. We have 40 trillion cells that are the bacteria and other organisms us, and only 30 trillion of our own cells. Oh, that's an incredibly complex system. We're not even close to that. We, it's thinking of the abacus compared to the computer, and that's the amount of complexity that we know is out there, and we're at the abacus stage. And yet they continue this, they continue this misguided, knowing that they're only engineering, including CRISPR and all these things. They're just playing with one piece of the puzzle, not knowing how it's going to affect the rest of it. That's grossly, scientifically negligent, and it represents a danger, not just to our health, but to the environment. I'm just glad I've got these, uh, these really smart people to say that kind of stuff, because I certainly couldn't say it. Uh, all I know is a, as a humanities person is the way I answer this question is I take uh, English majors out and teach them how to grow food. Uh, and you may be surprised to hear that, that even college students, now remember college students are uh, statistically among the most educated people in the history of humanity. And yet, ask them where potatoes grow and they're likely to say on trees <laughs> because they've never seen a potato grow ever. So in addition to all of that, there's also the fact that nobody has any idea where their food comes from. So there's uh, there are all kinds of approaches to this. One of the approaches I uh, have put my chips on is that uh, getting people to actually get their bodies back into the world is a really useful antidote to this. So you take a bunch of kids out and teach them about growing food, and you don't have to explain genetics to them. They just have an intuitive. There is this part of our body that is not just intellectual. Don't forget, there is the intuitive the spiritual, the aesthetic, all of that is also true. And, you know, you take a kid out to a farm and let them, uh, you know, cut some eggplants or grow some raspberries or whatever it is, and they don't need to know about genetics. They just know what is the right thing to eat. So there's also that part of it, too. I'd, I'd just like to remind us that we've got these other things going on, too, and those are worth investing in as well. I want to start off by saying I'm really excited to, with McKay and Mark, new, new authors on the, on, on the block, it's great to, to meet you. Uh, Andy, I've been seeing you around for longer than I want to admit. <laughs> and uh, it, older, it's true, it's, that's good news. And I've been admiring, Sheldon, your work for years, and this is the first time we've had a chance to meet and talk, and I've been wanting to meet you. In fact, uh, when they invited me to this, I made sure that I was in the same time slot as you, because I would have moved myself if, if you were coming at a different time, because I've been wanting to meet you for so long. Um, so you're watching uh, the real truth about health, and you may be seeing a lot of different things to do, a lot of different choices in terms of diet and whatnot. And if you want to be experimental about it, you may want to try one thing at a time, or everything, but if you try one thing at a time, you may want to do this. If you're not already 100% organic, change to 100% organic for several weeks. First, take a diary and write down uh, your energy level, your symptoms, your mood, behavior, all the symptoms and rate them one to 10. And then replace your diet 
Keep the same foods you're eating, but just change it to organic and write down every day the percentage of, of food that's organic, even the foods themselves, but also your symptoms, your energy level, your mood, behavior, etc. And if what we're seeing around the country is indicative, a certain percentage of people who do this will have life-changing, huge aha experiences. As, this, as the intractable skin conditions go away, as the, as the digestive problems go away, as the energy increases, as the brain fog recedes, and even in some cases, as you'll see in the film, Secret Ingredients, the autistic diagnosis gets taken away. And then we can look at other things based on that new baseline, where it's just removing the GMOs and the toxic chemicals and getting a little more phytonutrients and antioxidants, et cetera, that, that organic has. So I'd like to make that as my number one recommendation. Change your diet, switch to organic, and take notes. Okay, so I, a I, couple of things I'd leave you with. One is that the plant genome where all these changes are being made is not a Lego system. It's an ecosystem. And as people have said on this panel, far more complex than a Lego system. And Lego, you put in the Lego and you don't disturb anything else. With an ecosystem, you can disturb everything else in the system. Every product that's produced has to be rigorously evaluated by an independent agency or independent scientist. Otherwise, I don't trust it. And I don't think you should. <laughs>